Hello and welcome to episode 168 of Retro Encounter, RPG Fans Weekly Podcast. I'm Mike Solosi, and today we're here for an annual tradition here at Retro Encounter, where we basically go against, we belie the adjective in our title and talk about the most current games we can. It's our year in review episode, and I'm joined by four other Retro Encounter regulars, starting with Peter Treisenberg. This episode of Retro Encounter has been brought to you by tap water. Mm -mm -mm. Good old municipal tap water. Are you, are you sure, man? <laughs> don't, don't, don't you live in Michigan? Uh, fa to be fair, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Well, um, thanks, Peter and Tapwater. And joining Peter, Tapwater, and I is Rob Fenner. It's me. Hello, folks. Thanks for having me. Anytime. And joining Peter, Rob, and I is Leona McCallum. Hi, everybody. And rounding out our party of five is Alana Hakes. Hi, everyone. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have, between the five of us, played many RPGs this year. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, um, does 2018 seem unusually dense? <laughs> 2018 has been 10 years long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I thought last year was, like, full and unmanageable, but... Mm, mm, I think we've got a new rival. Yeah, um, I, maybe, and this is, I guess, my perception, but I thought that maybe 2017 had more sort of marquee big games that people were excited about, and 2018 started out seeming like it was going to be uh, less, but then as the year w went on, just but my backlog got stupider and stupider. Like, I, I think especially for the kind of games we're interested in, the RPGs and visual novels of the world, 2018 seemed unusually full and unusually good. I, there was a lot mm -hmm. of really good stuff that came out this year. And, and uh, I had a lot of difficulty picking my personal game of the year, but even though you probably are all assuming correctly what it is. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> What could it be? <laughs> and, uh, and speaking of game of the year stuff, RPG Fan is probably going to be rolling out our game of the year... Uh, content in the next few weeks uh there's a uh an on I, I, th I believe an online vote that recently ended and we're gonna have that go out uh alana is it in the first week of january around there's no set date yet the plan okay. is the first week first week or two of january yeah all right so yeah we, so we cannot talk about what uh um, what awards things have won in RPG fan because we are we are writing in the middle of writing the uh, those game of the year sort of um, final pieces right now but we should we cannot talk about that on the podcast what we can talk about is all of the games we played we're basically just gonna take turns in a round table going off of a big list of games that we've compiled here and uh, discuss them each in turn try to keep the discussion maximum four or five minutes because otherwise we could make this a four-hour podcast and nobody wants that especially me so um do we have a volunteer to uh pick our first discussion topic oh <laughs> uh, okay <laughs> that was a excellent having, sound effect <laughs> i'm having school flashbacks <laughs> Okay, no one's gonna come up to the blackboard and uh and 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 no. write the answer down. So, um, I'll I'll go first. The the very first game of the year that really seized me, uh, to the surprise of nobody, was Monster Hunter World. Um, that game came out in the middle of January. I think it, like the around the nineteenth or twentieth or so, and uh. We weren't sure whether to cover it or not, but there was a, a number of people on the website interested in it, so we just ultimately decided to ask for a code and cover it. And uh, I put 250 hours into that damn thing, and I, I mostly fell off it over the summer. So <laughs> it was a very packed-in 250 hours. Do we have any other Monster Hunters in the in the house? My boyfriend oh, yeah. is playing it right now behind me. Ah, okay. So we've, right. we've got it happening on happening on the pod. Maybe it's obvious, but I, I'm a little bit <laughs> invested in, into the into Monster Hunter. I started out playing the PSP games in the mid 2000s, but then stopped playing them around the Wii one because I just hate the I hated the controls on Monster Hunter Tri and Monster Hunter Three Ultimate. So I, I sort of skipped the third and fourth generations of Monster Hunter. But Monster Hunter World, which is I guess technically the first Gen Five Monster Hunter game, if we want to sort them like Pokemon, I got real deep into uh my other friends that i used to hunt with 10 12 years ago all got it too i played so much of it but i stopped um following it around 
uh, around the spring, like um, I, I didn't do many tempered hunts. I got back into it over the, in the summer to attempt the behemoth hunt, but I uh, I've mostly fallen off it. I, I think I might try and get back into it um, in 2019 because my friends are still asking me if I have time to hunt with them. <laughs> and, and those guys have put. In, I mean, I have 200 hours into it. They have probably closer to 2,000 hours into it. But it's it, it's a game that brought me back into a series that I used to love, and uh, and I think it's I think it's Capcom's most successful title ever in terms of sales, which seems insane. It is now, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, Capcom's been around a while. So, uh, 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 Rob, I, I thought. Yeah, I, I think I remember. I've even hunted. Take off. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, Rob, I've even hunted with you a couple times, haven't we? You, yeah, yeah, we have hunted together. Um, and I have, I have not dropped off this game. Uh, it has been a constant throughout my entire year, um, and um, it, it's been like a regular social event for me. Like I'll, I'll hang out with my friends, and we'll um, take part in like the weekly events or the seasonal uh, festivals. Um, I was just hunting, uh, hunting with a close friend um, for a couple of hours last night. Um, I really can't get enough of it. And I was really surprised because like, um, Monster Hunter has never been my thing. I've always been curious, but I just like, like the first one I played was the PS2 version. I was like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> um, and even playing that, that trial that came out, the, like the, the online test from, that came out around this time last year, I was like, mm, I don't know if this is for me, but like peer pressure means I'm probably going to get this. And, um, this is, um, yeah, this is is one of my top games of the year, um, undoubtedly, and I just can't get enough of it. It's extremely satisfying. Yeah, and it's it's really all about that multiplayer. Like the the single player is enough to introduce the, you to it's the mon- to the new monsters and settings one by one, but the uh, like the characters are silly and the plot is trite. It is really about getting mm-hmm. in those group hunts. I mean, the uh, multiplayer in Monster Hunter World is awesome. The, lots of coordination, lots of. Uh, uh, lots of intense gameplay, but also, um, also the world is big and beautiful and cool, and the monsters look amazing. Yeah, yeah, they do. Uh, Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate also came out in 2018 in most territories, uh, okay. and uh, and the differences between those two is Generations Ultimate is a culmination of 15 years or however long of Monster Hunter. It has almost every single game from the entire series previous to World. Because it uh, like the generations games had you revisit villages from four from three previous Monster Hunter games plus a fourth village, and Generations Ultimate added more monsters to Generations, so there's probably 120 damn monsters in that game, and it, it like that Generations Ultimate is like the final capstone on what Monster Hunter used to be, and Monster Hunter World is like the new chapter in what Monster Hunter is going to be going forward, because uh, we, we mentioned this a little bit, Monster Hunter World has so many small improvements and, and, uh, and player-friendly changes that uh, I, I find it extremely difficult to go back. Oh, yeah. I, I'm curious about um, Generations Ultimate, but at the same time, as somebody who really came into the series on World, the idea of dealing with... Um, uh, whetstones and paintballs and and all that stuff um, just sounds like um, a, a step that I don't think I would be able to deal with. And uh, discrete zones with loading screens and a, a number of yeah. other inconveniences. But uh, in general, the thing I want to see the most from World going forward is doing what Generations Ultimate did and just bring as many cool older monsters as they can. Like, wow. I would I would love to hunt a Nargakuga and a Zenogre and a Rajong in Monster Hunter World. And, uh, Rob, you, none of the four of you probably know what those things are. But <laughs> if they got announced for Monster Hunter World uh, expansion or sequel, I would be extremely excited. And we just had an expansion announced a few weeks ago, Iceborne. Yeah, which they're is, saying it's going to be ultimate-sized. Yeah, yeah, they're they're saying that it's going to be a new zone, a, a new story quest, new monsters, new everything. It's coming out fall of 2019, and uh, it's going it's probably going to be the first large uh, paid DLC for the game because Monster in the World has had a year, basically a year of free DLC that has been uh, pretty good. Hmm. Like, starting with the Devil Joe added within a few months of launch, and then the uh, Cool Vitaroth hunts, and then the Behemoth hunts, and then uh, um, uh, 
t um, arch, te arch tempered monsters, like a, a pretty good suite of free DLC for Monster Hunter World over the year. But the first big pay DLC being this Iceborne new continent, mm -hmm. which I'm I'm excited about. Oh yeah, I will be forking over for that as soon as uh, I'm at, as soon as I'm allowed to. I think that's going to be the thing that drags me back into hunting again, uh, yeah. or, or or maybe just before it comes out, I'll get back into hunting to you know shake the rust off. So yeah, we we oh boy, Rob, we can't accidentally turn this into a Monster Hunter podcast because I did that. We early. cannot. Yeah, we we did that in a in February of this year, um, <laughs> already. Uh, so does anyone have a non Monster Hunter game that they'd like to discuss? Uh, I can discuss uh, Shibuya Scramble. Which Ooh, is please a... do. I, I, oh shoot. Um, Rob, did you review that or talk I about did, it? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's after reading your review. I got really interested in it, but I don't know much about it. So Leona, give us the skinny on Shibuya Scramble. So Shibuya, 428 Shibuya Scramble is a visual novel and it's a bit different. Well, it's a bit different in West because usually our visual novels are the ones we get from Japan are all animated, but this one's uh live action. So it's real actors and it's, super weird <laughs> it's a it's, it's like a mix between like a comedy and a mystery thriller and mm -hmm. it's a bit like um you're playing as five different protagonists and you're each going through their sort of one there's like one day and there's been a kidnapping and it's so you're playing as a cop who's investigating the kid kidnapping you're playing as a, a father the father of one of the daughters who's been kidnapped uh, you're playing as like a mascot cat character who's trying to sell diet drinks. I... <laughs> uh, there's a journalist and there's just like a street a kid uh, who's obsessed with recycling. <laughs> but he's my favorite character. It's it's super interesting and it's uh, it plays sort of like um, each character has to do certain actions to affect what the other characters like timeline going forward if they do something we like wrong in their timeline it'll affect all the other characters timelines and they might die or they might have like i've had endings that are bad technically that are they become rich and live their fullest lives with their partners and have many children but you don't solve the mystery of the game so it's technically a bad ending. Did you get that farming ending? Is that what you're yes, referring to? farming <laughs> ending. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure I totally understand. Uh, you basically watch these five characters perform actions, and you can sort of switch between whose perspective that you're on, and there's different uh -huh. points where the player makes decisions? Yes, it's pretty much exactly that. So there's so like... Yeah. No, sorry, go ahead, Leona. No, so no, as, no, as, as, a, as a full motion video game, is this game better or worse than Night Trap? It's not FMV. No, it's, it's, it's photographed. Not. It's photographed. they're photographs. Oh, okay. So it's 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 a sound novel. It's a it's a visual. It's like a, a precursor to the visual novels by by Tunesoft. Um, oh, is this like that, that that Saturn game that is always at the top of Famitsu Machi. rankings? This, this yes. is the spiritual. This is the spiritual oh. sequel to Machi, and it's got oh. some shared characters. Okay, Machi is one of those games that I've only read about, but uh, reading about it and knowing its level of acclaim has had me infinitely curious about it for at least a decade. So this is yeah. if, I'm, if, same, I'm, if I'm if I'm if I'm morbidly okay if I'm morbidly curious about Machi, then this is something I want to try. Shibuya Scramble was like that game for me because I read about it. It came out on the Wii like years ago in yeah. Japan, and we never got it. And I was all, and I always said it was like one of the best visual novels people were saying, and I was like, oh, I've got to try it, but it'll probably never come out here. But it did, and we all get to enjoy it now. So, like, say for example, um, you're playing, you're playing as a street tough, and uh -huh. you're trying to escape from somebody who's chasing you, and um, I don't know, you, 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 there's these gangsters with guns running around, and you see one from behind, and you, I don't know, throw a rock at him and knock him out, and then, and then your street tough gets away. Um, and then like, if you switch back to the cop, you'll find out that like, actually he wasn't a gangster and it was this cop and he got hit from behind with a rock and then like, you get a game over there. So you have to like go back and, um, make a different choice so that street tough won't, um, accidentally knock out this cop. That's, yeah. that's how these characters interact with each other. Hmm. And so, so, and the decisions like this can sort of cascade on each other because these are five characters acting their lives simultaneously. Yeah. Um, can you like switch between characters with a couple presses of buttons? Or yeah, you have. Yeah, you can. You have to. It's just. I mean, and on the PC, you just hit F two, and then you have like a timeline of all the characters. Each chapter is an hour, and like each mm -hmm. scene is a five minute block. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Huh. That's. That's crazy. I'm just trying to think of the of the number of possibilities and. Uh, oh, it's it's a lot of possibilities. It yeah. reminds me of. Um, have you ever seen uh, Lola Ren or uh, Run Lola Run? The yeah, movie? I have. I have. Mm. Yes. It, it reminds me a lot of that. It's like small and small little actions, and you change a certain thing, and then all of a sudden, it just is a completely different uh, story that you're watching. And are the and, endings character centric or? Yes. Sort of over. Okay. So it's, it's like it's like whose character. Which character you're, the player is with at a certain yes. point will will put you on an ending path. Yep, exactly. It's like 120 okay. bad endings. Oh yeah, yeah. There, there's yeah. a. I think it's like the rarest trophy is to get all the bad endings. <laughs> That's that, um, that sounds like a very lengthy game facts document. <laughs> but every time you get a bad ending, it gives you a hint on like yeah. what you should do to avoid that. Yeah, which is helpful. Okay. But man, 120 endings, all these small decision points that the player makes. This almost seems like an exercise in trial and error uh, to, 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 to sort of see what happens with all these different combinations of events. Uh, did, it, did it get – was there enough logic for you to find the solution to the mystery or a satisfying ending that it, yeah. that it, that it seemed fair or did it seem like just almost too random? Um, Cause I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to think of what, what parts of this game would frustrate me if I were tr to try and play it. I, I say even if you pick the wrong choice, getting the bad ending is worth watching because they're usually quite funny. Uh, <laughs> so right. it's, trying, it's trying to ambush you and surprise you, yes. and the checkpointing is, is is you know it allows you to jump around this timeline as you see fit at any time. So there's not really much of a penalty. Yeah, and if you if you get a like if you pick the wrong decision, the bad ending comes within like a couple of minutes. It's not like you're playing the entire game and then you get the bad ending. It's just a matter of you pick the wrong decision here's why you died or you're living your best life or whatever. And then you just go back to that, that point and you pick the right option. Cool. Well, that game sounds satisfying. Uh, I'm sorry, not satisfying. I meant to say fascinating. Um, it is. Especially with the connection to Machi, a game that I've only read about and have been curious about for a long time. Uh, thanks for bringing this up. It's This game's 40% off PSN right now, so I'm thinking about it, but I really it's don't... It's worth it. I really it's don't, so uh, amusing. I really don't need to buy another thing in December when, uh, <laughs> when I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to afford gifts for my friends and family. But yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, this looks good. I'm definitely going to put it on a wish list or something because uh, everything you're saying about it makes it sound awesome. Um, so, uh, Peter, do you have a game on the list that you uh, like to discuss for the podcast? Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing, and we talked about this a little recently, but uh, a Pokemon uh, Let's Go came out this year. The remakes of uh, Pokemon Yellow, the Gen 1 games for uh, now, now in glorious high definition on Switch. And uh, it's fun. It's really fun. It is a adorable, nostalgic romp through a familiar game that kind of makes... It, it, I think it's like a good... It's kind of intended as like a beginner pokemon game kind of to like bridge mm -hmm. the gap for new players who came in off of the mobile game pokemon go right that's the one thing that scared me off a little bit i i'm not a fan of pokemon go and i was <laughs> a, a little worried that um like that this game was uh at like half a remake of yellow and half bridging the gap between pokemon go and the console or handheld pokemon games um <laughs> How, how much then, go? How much go influence is in this game? Uh, the main the main influence from Pokemon Go is catching Pokemon. Um, so in Let's Go, there are no random encounters. Um, Pokemon appear in the field, and you can choose which ones you bump into. You always know which Pokemon you're going to be uh, encountering. That's a really positive change, and it's something I hope they keep going forward. Um, once you encounter a wild Pokemon, you enter. You basically enter the capture screen from pokemon go where uh you the pokemon's in front of you and it's moving around and there's a little ring that slowly shrinks down and the goal is to use the switch's motion controls either with the joy con or the gyro sensor uh in handheld mode to throw a pokeball and catch and catch the pokemon that way um so you don't actually fight wild pokemon it's purely uh catching them um, and I wasn't sure how I was going to handle uh, how I was going to like this change at first, just because, like, I mean, Pokemon's a very traditional series. It's been that way for a, a, the way it is for a long time. 
Um, I don't mind it. I think it's kind of fun. And, you know, like being able to physically throw a Pokeball is like 10 year old Peter's dreams come true. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they... being able to ride on the belly of a Snorlax lumbering around is 10 year old Solosi's dream come true. I used to throw tennis balls at my sister. Does that count? Does you know what? I'll allow it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I will not allow it. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, be, being able to ride a Snorlax by holding on to its belly is good and pure. But, uh, and then it, the game is still a traditional Pokemon RPG. You have trainer battles. Are, those are still intact and carried over from the original games. Although, um, the caveat is that uh, it is a little bit of a stripped down combat system, not in terms of like, you still have all your moves and, you know, fight item, all that stuff. But, um, pass. Passive abilities are no longer a thing, mm-hmm. um, and hold items oh, okay. either. So, it, which to be fair, I suppose that is accurate to the original red, blue, yellow. Do, but do, um, do they have a special defense stat? They do have. They do have special attack and special defense. Okay. Stats. Okay. And and actually, one thing that uh, let's go adds is you can check after a certain point in the game you can check your pokemon's iv stats at any time it they actually make it a very easy oh here is the your pokemon are basically ranked from okay to good to great to amazing to perfect yeah they, um, they, they, they gave you ways to check ivs in sun moon but uh they, they're, oh yeah they're a little they're a little hidden it's it's still uh it's it's still very deep in the mm-hmm. arcane of what Pokemon is dealing with uh-huh. the, with IVs and a, to yeah. a lesser degree EVs, but um, but but not but not EVs like Let's Go Eevee. <laughs> uh, sp- but, speaking speaking of which, which version did you play? Uh Pikachu. Let's go Pikachu. I went okay. for the nostalgia there. Uh, it, it, it was a hard choice. Um, because they're both adorable, and you have basically you have your partner, you get your partner Pokemon at the start of the game, like you know every other Pokemon, and it's either a Pikachu or an Eevee, depending on which version you got. And then that Pokemon is your partner for the entire game. It will it rides around on your shoulders or on your head. Um, yeah. You can dress it up, you can pet it. Um, they the they, it be, they learn the uh, the special techniques, the uh, what used to be HMs. Uh, which so your Pikachu will like break out a surfboard and that's how you surf or your Pikachu <laughs> will uh, smash rocks, um, stuff like that. It's and weird then, that they don't let them evolve, but I guess it's not let's go Raichu. Yeah, they, I think they don't let them because it's because they want you to have that mascot the relationship with your mascot Pokemon. And it is yeah. kind of like and but, yeah. it's right there in the name. It's all about the evolution. Yeah. <laughs> Shoot, Al- Alana, you also played this game. Did you get the uh, Pikachu or Eevee version? I got Pikachu as well, so um, I, I had my little one else. Yeah, else. yeah um, I didn't want to go for Eevee because you couldn't evolve it. I'd care less about Raichu than I do about my evolution. But the, thing, the thing is, I was reading about the super moves that Eevee can learn, and it learns like psychic. It yeah. learns a, an elemental move of each of its evolution types that also gets a that also gets like a bonus. Or something, something like, like this sounds insane. Like this yeah. is the best move set of any Pokemon ever. The only problem is it's locked into an above average Eevee. <laughs> <laughs> but Eevee is a powerhouse, and actually Pikachu gets some really good moves as well. But I took the starter out pretty quickly. I had okay. Jolteon in instead of Pikachu because oh. that's my so, so that's so my you... real electric mouse. Yeah. All right, all right, that's that's fair. I mean, I guess he. But but can Jolteon Zippy Zap is the question. Jolteon cannot Zippy Zap. <sighs> uh... <laughs> Even if you take the starter out of your party, it still sticks around with your character. So mm-hmm. it's like it's it's a viable option. I kept it in there because I'm like, was, again, Zippy Zap. It's busted. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, do we have another uh, another game on the dock that we want to discuss for the podcast? Uh, sure, I'll go next because I've been a bit quiet. Um, I'll go with CrossCode, which is probably one that nobody here has played, but I want to give some a shout out to because it was a real. It was. I was really promised by it by playing the early access back in 2016, and I was like, "No, I really, really want to see this do well." And it's one of those few instances where I've gone, "Nope, they fulfilled everything," and I'm really happy. So, CrossCode is an action RPG. Uh, it's PC Steam only. Potential PS4 port in the works, maybe. Um, but the developers are quite stretched at the moment, um, dealing with some post-launch things. Uh, so, the idea of CrossCode is you are playing a avatar in an MMO world 
and you go around, you do MMO kind of things. It's not an online game, so it's a single player RPG, kind of like East, kind of like Secret of Mana combat y style. But yeah, there's like MMO mechanics in it. So there's like, uh, what do you call it? Like uh, gathering and things like that. So you have to destroy plants to gather materials. And then you have like a log that keeps track of them. But the main draw of cross code is kind of like the combat and the puzzle systems in it. So everything in cross code is a bit of a puzzle and there's a similar zelda structure in where there are elemental temples that you go to these are really big endurance tests and they won't suit everybody so most i think i averaged maybe an hour and a half at least on each of them two hours 30 for one of them at least i would say they Rex, are that, that, is, that is an endurance test around how long is the game and how many of those big temples are in it there are the game I clocked in forty hours, and I didn't do all the side Whoa. quests. Whoa! Yeah, it's not big. sure. It's a big game. Um, I, I mean, it was in development for. Uh, I'm just just doing some side googling here. Uh, in development for six years, so this is mm. you, you're getting yeah. your money's worth out of this thing. Yeah, they're working on some DLC as well. So there was some stuff they couldn't get in um, that they're going to do post launch, which is exciting. There are yeah, I want to say that's five. Wild. Five. There's no, there's six temples. So there's five elemental temples and one final dungeon, um, all in increasing difficulty. So each of these temples rewards you with an element that you can utilize in combat. So you get, these are probably not the correct names. So you get fire, ice, shock, and wave. Wave is like sound waves, but I suppose semi-water related. Um, and you each of those dungeons utilizes the opposite element. So like the ice dungeon utilizes the fire element. So you have to use that to like defrost bricks and hit balls in certain ways and things like that um but they're really clever some of the puzzles some of them are kind of frustrating and like you have to try over and over again and a lot of them have really small wind margins for error but i think it was really refreshing to play something that had actual temples in it and actual dungeons because there seems to be a outside of maybe east games and a couple of other games there's not really Dungeons seem to be a weakness in RPGs, ignoring yeah. Persona 5 last year. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, okay, Persona 5's dungeons were a whole thing on themselves, but uh, but mm -hmm. you're basically right. It's, when I think of things like, uh, oh shoot, uh, recently Dragon Quest or, um, or, or, or Octopath or, or, yeah. ta or Tales games of the past yeah. couple of years, dungeons are more about corridors and, and sort of and a sense of place and less about mechanics and puzzles. But this is... This this is bringing back a lot of old school uh, concepts, I guess. And and um, but an indie game with this look uh, that's forty hours and rich with content. Th th this sounds incredible. Um, wh what's the basics of action like? Are, are like are is the running and attacking at least fun, or does it get old over those forty hours? Uh no, it's really fun. So it starts off pretty basic. Um, you just have an attack button. You can dodge. You can guard. And then as you get these that's additional a, that, elements... That's, that's already more than like every <laughs> every Super Nintendo RPG. <laughs> exactly. And then you... Oh, you can cross-dash as well. Um, so you can like super dash across platforms and things. Um, but the, again, these elements are not just puzzle-related. You can use them for combat as well. So you get like charged arts. So every element has a guard-charged art, an attacking-charged art, a ranged-charged art and a dash charged R, and you can level those up with a skill tree, which is called a circuit board, because they're all MMO characters. Sweet and things. Moses. Um, yeah, so it's really, really in-depth, and you won't... You can also reset these skill boards a few times. You get five automatically to reset, because you have a basic one as well that gives you basic combos, like non-elemental. Um, there is a drawback. You can't use elements all the time, so you do overheat if you use them too much, so... You need to swap out of them. It's really easy to do. Um, you just swap out of the element and go to neutral attacking and then it recharges and it doesn't take very long either. But yeah, you have like essentially, um, well, over 30 charged attacks if you want to take in every element and every <laughs> neutral. Um, uh, can, can you switch elements on the fly or do you equip them in a separate menu? No, you can switch them on the fly using uh, the D-pad on the Xbox controller is what I used. But if you're using a mouse, you can use the wheel. Um, so, yeah. This has more moves than like any Devil May Cry game. I'm floored with, your, with this description. <laughs> uh, it's really, really in-depth. And 
I was starting to get weary about midway through, but things really pick up. And the more elements you get, the more fun you can have with it. And like I say, even like boss fights are a puzzle as well. So like you have to use the opposite element and then you have to use a guard art to reflect and you can stun enemies. Like some enemies you can't even beat unless you stun them. Some of them you can't beat unless you beat other enemies on the screen. Like it's just a lot has gone into it. And I think props to the developers because I was kind of hope I was kind of expecting to be disappointed and I wasn't and it kept getting better and better. I think I was frustrated at times, but yeah, it was just a it was a joy. It was an absolute joy to play through. I loved it. It looks like a lot of time and effort and love went into this game and your your description of its of its uh, breadth and depth is frankly a little shocking for an indie RPG. This looks <laughs> awesome. And, well, and the, main, the main characters look like they popped out of a fantasy star, uh, like fantasy star universe or something. Yeah, they all have really you unique do. personalities, which is cool. Um, like the well, the main character's mute, but it's because she's got and she's like there's a problem with her avatar, so she's lost her speech function. <laughs> so, so they um, so they, expl <laughs> they explained away the silence of the silent protagonist. Yeah, basically, but there's like a. <laughs> A hacker, I'll I say. Love, I, I love it when games do stuff like that. <laughs> There's someone working behind the scenes to give her speech functions, so every now and again she'll learn like a new word. So she starts off by just saying hi and bye and her name, and then she'll yeah, she gets other things as well. But <laughs> gee, Alana, thanks. Now I have another game to add to my <laughs> wish list and pile of unplayed things in 2018. Well, I mean, I've already got 428. Should be a scramble. So, you know, how many <laughs> more too. can I have on my list? Okay, oh, great. guys, guys, we we play, guys, we play too many. We play too many good games in Retro Encounter. Let's talk about a bad game. Oh God, <laughs> you want a bad game? <laughs> well, I want, I want, I want to actually pick your brain about something, Alana. Um, uh, oh no, because you're, you're the only one I know here who played the new Dissidia. Ah, uh, oh so, so, yeah. So, so talk to, talk to me about how Square tried to make an esport game and failed. Oh. They, they tried to turn Dissidia into like Marvel versus Capcom three, and then they brought in Team Ninja and tried to make it esports, and somehow none of it came together. But they, but at, at, least, at least Locke looks hot. I mean, right? Yeah, exactly. He's a Locke. handsome, been, handsome Lock. They've been supporting it. Like they had the you know just got, joined the game like yesterday, two days ago. Like the, uh, as of this recording, like so that at the very mm -hmm. least they are offering new content. It's not like they've abandoned the game. I but... think we'll, we'll know the last DLC character by the way, the by the time the episode goes live because I think oh, they have okay. a live stream on the eighteenth. But yeah, they're still um, supporting it. Yeah, there's one more DLC character to announce. Oh, I hadn't yeah. realized oh that. no! Is it Joker from Persona Five? Wait, wait, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, yeah, yeah, you'll never see it coming. Hi. Uh, um, quick, as, quick aside before we go back into the Dissidia discussion. How about this year for crossover DLC? Holy crap! Yes. Jeez, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna r rattle a couple off. We have, uh, we have uh, Joker from Persona Five in Smash Brothers Ultimate. We have. Uh, 2B from Near Automata in Soul Calibur 6. We have Final Fantasy 14 and Monster Hunter World um, putting monsters in each other's games in my favorite crossover of all time. Like, it, it is... Uh, and, oh, shoot. Who was the most recent entry into Tekken 7? Uh, uh, well, Negan. Negan. Yeah, yeah, Negan from The Walking I, Dead in Tekken yeah. 7. That's just weird. I mean, I, I thought that Akuma and Geese were perfect in that game, but then uh, Noctis and Negan oh, Noct are, 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 are a bit more head-scratching. <laughs> I could have Noctis. I could have Noctis fight Jeffrey Dean Morgan, and I'm really okay with that. Honestly, yeah. you have you have no idea how excited I was watching that Geese trailer in 2017 for the first time. Okay, maybe you have some idea, but uh, <laughs> but like, like 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 tears came to my eyes watching the bad dads fight each other. It was excellent. Right. So anyway, back to Dissidia. Uh, back to things that are bad. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I, I I played a Dissidia. Uh, NT demo at E3 2017, and oh, I yeah. was uh, I was confused and disappointed, and I think that confusion and disappointment uh, sort of held over onto the main release, if I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah, very much so. I haven't touched it since I reviewed it, so that tells you something. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Um. I was almost tempted to go back when Locke went in because I was like, oh yeah, but then I was like, I do, uh, I, I do have the DLC because it came with the review copy. Um. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah I was gonna say, you didn't you didn't fork over like 25 bucks for that good <laughs> no i didn't um but i think what's disappointing because i loved i derek also reviewed this for cgm um both of us are big fans of dissidia on the psp like they're complete nonsense and i think it's fair to say peter i know you've tried them and don't like 
them. Is that correct? I, I just I just couldn't get a handle on them. Like I thought the the controls were really floaty, and I wasn't like I just yeah I I, I couldn't get into. It. I like the idea. I I, 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 I really really liked the Dissidia games on PSP. Um, I I, yeah. did, I I didn't play through all of Duo Decum, but uh, the 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 loop of that really weird um sort of uh. Like, like like 3D space combat with turn based elements and a lot of weird attacks, but characters that feel unique. It, um, it I thought it was really cool. Final Fantasy fan service and uh, and yeah. Final Fantasy RPG fighting games, three things I love. Obviously, I put some hard time into that. I, w- I will say <laughs> that Dissidia Dis- Dis- Duo Decum is one of the best uh, Final Fantasy remix albums I've ever listened to. <laughs> yeah, the remix music is really good on it. I, I like the version of uh, of Over Those Hills in Dissidia more than the FF9 version. So sorry, Alana, that's a little sacrilegious. <laughs> it's fine. I'm not precious about nine sounds. Well, it's like it's, it's, it's like it's like how it's like how literally any version of Blue Fields sounds better than the Blue Fields that plays in FF8. Like right, <laughs> yeah. Um, for as good as the music in FF7 and FF8 is, the uh, uh, that like MIDI soundscape that they live in is not is not great. It's like, it's like, why do these fake clarinets sound like bees buzzing? But <laughs> twang, 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 twang. We can talk about MIDI music later if you want. Like. Oh, for soundtrack of the air. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That sounds like a different podcast. But anyway, um, how much more Dissidia talk do we have in us before we just get a little sad? Uh, I would say avoid it. It's extremely floaty. There's barely any single player content. The online modes are good. Uh, It takes a lot of getting used to. And also the three on three is rubbish. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know why they went three on three. I don't think it, um, like, like some fighting games are team games and some aren't. And some of them like are fake team games, like King of Fighters, where you pick three characters, but it's all one on one anyway. But I mean, I mean, the team gameplay seems to add to the confusion and not add to the fun uh, when I mm-hmm. when I played the demo. And, yeah, and, and that's was, exactly what it is. And, and the characters were deep enough and varied enough, and the and the roster was large enough in the original Dissidia that I I never felt limited by the one on one fights. The stages are so big as well, and then there's all the summons that can happen as well, and all of the... Some stages have stage hazards as well, so it's like there's so much going on at any one time that it's just... You just completely lose track of everything, and when then it being three on three, it's like, oh, okay. Um, if one if one of your team dies three times, you lose. It doesn't have to be everyone dies once. If one of your team is not very good and, and they die three times, then uh, that's it, which is punishing for the team. Then... <laughs> Yeah, punishing for you, but also punishing for them, because it's then you get some unsavory people who are like, oh, you're rubbish. And it's like, well, you know what? I don't care. Unsavory people playing video games online? Never. (laughs) I know, right? Crazy. (laughs) All right, well, want to switch it up and talk about a good game next? Does anybody have a suggestion? I have the suggestion that is... (laughs) <laughs> in my opinion, maybe the goodest game of the year, in fact. I was, I was wondering how long it would take to get to it. Hey, I... Oh, I, Metal Max. <laughs> cool. I'm, I'm, I, I had oh to God. hold back a little bit. <laughs> um, Dragon I'm Quest XI cool. uh, came out in 2018 in every territory other than Japan, and um, I liked it a lot. It consumed my... Uh, I, had, I had to start it a little late, because I had... Um, I had a, a podcast that I was a game that I was working on in early December, early September. But <laughs> when I finally got around to Dragon Quest XI, it completely consumed me. I got I uh, beat it with a platinum trophy, which is not a, not a terribly challenging platinum trophy, much which is good for my you know physical and mental well being. But mm-hmm. um, it, it it's extremely beautiful. The Toriyama designs have never looked better. The monsters have never looked more expressive. The story is. In a way, very traditional JRPG, but also a little tiny bit subversive. Because, uh, like, you go to the, the in the first hour of the game, you go to you uh, learn you're the chosen one. You go to meet the king of the good kingdom, and the king says, mm-hmm. "Hey, if the chosen one always comes to fight the demons, how do we know the chosen one doesn't cause the demons?" <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like, well, uh, just because you only see umbrellas out in the rain does not mean that umbrellas cause rain, but then he does not, he, he does not appreciate that argument and throws you in the dungeon, and then the story really gets going. Uh, Dragon Quest XI is a very traditional JRPG, very traditional Dragon Quest game, but, with a, but is beautiful and cool, and with enough new stuff that I... I, I loved all of it. Like the the skill trees work great. The the group attacks, which are called pep powers, are really fun to pull off. Uh, 
Oh shoot! You can ride around on your horse, and uh, there's visual and en- there's visual encounters in the field, not so not random ones, and you can just run through ones on your horse if you don't want to deal with them. <laughs> I did so much of that. It was yeah. so fun. You uh, knock them and they go flying. You can knock bears over. Bears. <laughs> you know, it's a little nonplussed if it's, when, if I, it's when I first than... heard playing, and I needed to level grind, and I was like, I'm just gonna run into this with my horse, and then they just like went flying and died, and I was like, oh, <laughs> but that's not that's not gonna get me any experience. No. But it's, it's very amusing to watch. If they're if they're uh, if they're bigger than you on your horse, then you can't run them over. So like big dragons and uh, and trolls, I don't think can be knocked over for the most part. Mm-hmm. But it's it, it, man, that game is so much fun, and I played so much of it, and I love the eight main characters, and I love this game so much. So uh, does anyone else have Dragon Quest thoughts before I just you know speak for another forty five minutes straight? <laughs> like um, it's it's I, it's great. It's very much like Dragon Quest Eight Two, which is um my yeah. It's I guess that's my favorite type of Dragon Quest. I know it won't appeal to everybody, but I like those um I like those strong personalities um that we rarely get in favor of like a lighter touch. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty much my take on it. Um, I'm also part of the Dragon Quest Eleven Platinum Club. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, hey. oh yeah. I know. Um surprise uh yeah i loved it um it basically consumed my entire october we are gonna have a dedicated dragon quest 11 spoiler cast i think next week if my if scheduling holds up um so uh, we're gonna have many many more dragon quest 11 thoughts on that episode but it, it's uh it, it was probably my favorite rpg of the year uh i'm i'm waffling between that monster hunter and one other game um but i i Man, like like if you like Dragon Quest Eight, and were and want another game like that, then this is exactly that. Or if you're maybe Dragon Quest curious, but th- or but think that it's a little too that that other Dragon Quest games are maybe a little bit too antiquated, this one it it feels the newest and freshest of any Dragon Quest game. Um, but yeah. it's still but it's still turn based combat. You're still. Uh, I don't want to say the perfect I, starting point, isn't it? Really? Yeah, it's it is. Nice yeah. Place. Like even more so than eight, I would say, but um, they kind of play off each other really nicely. Um, and I would mm-hmm. recommend it, especially if you've never played the like, turn based from traditional. I feel like rather than going back to something like Final Fantasy One or something, then Dragon Quest Eleven is probably the most modern traditional turn based RPG you can pick up, <laughs> most accessible as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it, it's excellent. I, I don't want to hammer the point over and over, but if if you're interested in turn-paced combat Japanese RPGs and you're not turned off by Toriyama designs, I, I think you abs- it's absolutely a must-play game. And it's oh, and, and, it, and it's long, but didn't feel over long to me. Like yeah, it's really well paced. Because you know, like seven is like 120 hours, and that's <laughs> that's the P- a tall PS1 order. version is the the 3DS version mm. cuts that almost in half. But uh, but it, 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 I've it, still like, got about 100 hours on that. Yeah, <laughs> seven is a little over long. Eleven mm. like. Uh, I, I ended up putting over, I think, just over a hundred hours in, into it. I did, I did almost everything you could do, and at around a hundred and five hours, I wasn't sick of it yet. <laughs> <laughs> they need to lose Sugiyama like yesterday. He's so bad. <laughs> it, it's it's a little sad to say that my favorite song in Dragon Quest Eleven is a remix of a Dragon Quest Five song in one of the towns. I know yeah. what you mean as well. It's yeah, that's like what I like. <laughs> a lot of reused music in this one, and a I mean, lot it's of reused all music, and and, uh, and and but... also there, it's not a very vast soundtrack, so it'll it'll be Ooh. the same world map music and the same battle music for everything in the game. And in, in a decision uh. I thought was a little puzzling, uh, so there's some really cool cutscenes in this game, just cutscenes yeah. with a lot of action and drama. But for most of them, the background soundtrack will keep playing during the cutscene. I think so. so it's, like, I, it's like it's like why is this bad world map tune happening in this dramatic fight scene between the hero and Hendrik? I was very much looking forward to this game, and I'm 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 very keen on it. I think it is absolutely one of the best RPGs of the year. Um, however, like I think part of what's making me not spend as much time with it as as I would have is the soundtrack. Um, I listen I mean, like, to so this, many podcasts playing Dragon Quest Eleven. So I might I might a do large that number. <laughs> But it's like you know here here is a um he, here's a town that's like um uh, uh northern Africa here's a town that's like uh, Venice um here's a, a port town here's a kingdom and they all have the same music and it's yeah like, it really takes me out of it it's bad music <laughs> yeah damn 
But uh, <laughs> uh, enough Dragon Quest talk. Let's talk about another game that came out in 2018 and has turn-based combat, but excellent music instead. Oh, yeah. You know where I'm going with this? Octopath Traveler. Damn straight! Hey. Still, have, still have to play it. It's on my shelf. I, 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 I only played the beginning of this. I played through one of the eight starting chapters. Really? Uh, but I, I got sidetracked by a lot of things over the summer. Um, and, and then Dragon Quest XI happened and it was game over. But, <laughs> uh, but Octopath is, um, I, I would say, uh, 16-bit inspired because it, it because it, it's sprite work and uh and and no 3D except for some effects but and uh, and tr- fairly traditional turn-based combat but really mm-hmm. goes beyond its 16-bit influences. Did anyone here uh, finish it through? Uh I did. Uh not post game though. So I've done all eight quests, all four quests for all eight characters but haven't that really That still sounds them. like a lot cuz I mean if you <laughs> if you do all that that you're you're pushing 60-70 hours. I'm on 65 hours, yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, I was that was a better guess than I thought originally. But all right, so so uh, what do you think were some of the strengths of Octopath Traveler? Because it was oh. it's really popular among uh, the among our RPG fan audience. All, Octopath stuff does, always did amazing on social. Yeah, it did. Um, so we've already mentioned the music. I think the music and the visuals are the two strongest points of the game, which mm-hmm. seems a bit obvious. Mm. But you know, the style of it, it feels so very pretty. Big. It's so picture um, book, isn't it? So, like, I think the special edition mm-hmm. comes with the diorama, doesn't it? That looks like one of those. Yeah, it comes with the. It, it comes with the, wait, it comes with the characters. Yeah, it comes with a book that you can open like a pop up book. Right. And I, exactly. I, I, I have that special edition, which is maybe all the more embarrassing <laughs> that I've only sunk about two hours in. Uh, it, it's oh, it's on my yeah. list of 2019 targets for sure, though. Um, so yeah, those two work really well together. I mean, for a debut soundtrack, um, Nishiki's work is incredible. Like, it's so varied. It's so, there's so many different instruments used. It's really incredible. And I think hey, hey, the hey. combat, N- hey. N- N- Nishiki, yeah. you, you want to do the soundtrack for Dragon Quest XII? Because I, yeah. I, 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 I would have no objections. This is my suggestion. This is my suggestion. Um, and then there's a the combat as well, which we've already touched on. Um, so it is traditionally turn-based, um, but there is a two things that make it really interesting. The first one is the oh, it's the boost system. So every character gets a boost meter. It goes up by one every turn, and you can use up to four boosts at a time, and it changes how many times they attack or how strong their special attack is or anything like that. And you basically need that to really push through most boss fights um yeah you need to use it all the time because it speeds up combat it just makes it really fun really varied uh you can also use it for support skills as well so if you use it for like a buff it will increase the number of turns it's active for or something like that um but yeah i always i always used it on uh prem's dances uh the that the random dance it's because I like rolling the slots every battle to see if I'm gonna <laughs> if she's just gonna murder my entire party or if I'm just gonna level up ten levels. Yeah, if you're gonna do it, go hard or go home. Really, like, <laughs> it, yeah, it's gonna be on turn four. I, I normally hate uh, super random attacks in RPGs and av- and avoid gambling characters sometimes uh, because of that. But th- with her, the effects are so crazy and the rewards seem so good that I, I think that's the way to do it. To, to to like Alana said, just just go big or go home when it comes to gambling or randomness attacks in RPGs. But mm-hmm. it, look, I think this is this is not des- developed by the same team as the Bravely Games, but it had some of the same Square producers behind. The- them. So I think that's like the turn manipulation is feels like a continuation of the Bravely games, which are games I, I am obsessed with yeah, to a degree. Yeah. Uh, and but the but the and also the ideas of these different classes and character synergy and all the insane number of combinations you can do is also a little yeah. bit Bravely esque. But th- th- these are all compliments. Like the uh, this the uh, depth of the turn based combat in this game and uh, the potentials of the different class systems and these and class specific skills seem insane a, a little bit overwhelming even yeah like everything works with everything almost um i re- i i could never get into the bravely series and i was really worried i wouldn't be able to get into octopath but um i think the kind of condensed nature of it so there's eight characters eight classes eight sub 12 subclasses um there's four once you get to chapter 4 of everybody's um mm-hmm. stories um it kind of makes it really manageable and that's something I really appreciate. Um, the nice thing as well is, is every class has got sub skills and you can learn them on every character as you level up the class or get more character points or skill points. And, or and eventually you can subclass every character. So every character, exactly. yeah. so every character can, uh, 
you know, use some many of the skills of another class. And with eight characters, eight classes, plus a couple, a handful of extra classes, I mean, holy smoke. Yeah, exactly. I like making Ulbrich into like a subclass cleric, so he was kind of like a paladin figure, this heavy knight with healing mm -hmm. skills. Yeah, I had him as like an, an apothecary. Like a Final Fantasy one knight. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I had him as an apothecary because he could just, like, the apothecary class is surprisingly sturdy, so it just made Ulbrich like this big brick wall, and it's mm. like... You can heal occasionally and do you can throw out those ri ridiculous bombs that you just uh, mix <laughs> on the fly and do like super damage. Yeah, Alfin is concealing a lot of things in that little bag of his. Um, yeah, extraordinarily dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was just a really, I think it gets a bit of flack for maybe rightly its story and its pacing and its structure. Um, I personally really like the way it's split into eight stories and. Maybe controversially, I really like Alfin and Tress's paths because they're so small scale. Like they're not like Primrose's like a small story. Scale path, yeah. Exactly. Primrose's story is about revenge, and I have separate issues about Primrose's story that I won't go into here. Um, but um That's a weird like, story. The weird <laughs> story. Yeah. It feels um, like a totally different tone from the rest of the game, Prim story. Yeah, it does. Prim like Therian story. Yeah. 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 Um, but like Alfin and Tressa in particular, because they're like trying to perfect their craft basically one is a merchant one is an apothecary there i kind of like I, I only played one but cyrus's story main story about being a, you of know of course you pick cyrus first <laughs> of course i would yeah <laughs> i identify I with him a little did. bit <laughs> but uh, but like him just dealing with sort of politics of a at a university and um and 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 with him also sort of being clueless to his own surroundings i it it, it felt a little different from a traditional RPG uh, origin story, and I kind of like how these stories are separate but come together, kind of like uh, a few old saga games, or maybe Dragon Quest IV, or maybe even kind of. maybe even Second and Setsu Three. There's a very small link, and you really have to pay attention to pick up on it on some. Really? Um, yeah. So I think it pops up on most people's chapter four, but the this post. I was going to ask you next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so these are th these. Don't I've only done everybody's chapter two. Okay. So these, yeah, don't, these so... don't converge very cleanly. They sort of stay parallel. Um. Yeah. So they're pretty parallel. And um, the weird thing about Octopath is that the characters don't really acknowledge that the other characters are there in their story. Yeah. <laughs> they have little vignettes outside of it, like skits from Tales games, I suppose. But yeah, like there's one scene that's really jarring in the. I think it's either Tressa or Ophelia. She runs up to a group of people. And this group of people are like, oh, so you're really foolish to come here on your own. And then you go straight into a fight. And it's like, no, no I have seven people with them. me. <laughs> exactly. Um, but... <laughs> that seems strange to me. And this was a complaint that I read about uh, in Octopath mm -hmm. Traveler. Like when, when I think of uh, games with cool casts, I think p part of it, part of what I think enhances my enjoyment of the cast is the character interactions. So for, yeah. um, for, I don't know. In an old school RPG, it would be their uh, how they interact in story scenes. In games like your uh, Dragon Ages and Mass Effects of the world, it's the party banter. But this game doesn't seem to have. There's almost no character interaction or party banter outside of these skits, I suppose, until the last ten percent of the game, which seems weird, mm -hmm. especially since this game nails so many other parts of uh, of the JRPG checklist of things Solosi loves. <laughs> I'd, I'd argue that there's not even really any like uh memorable npc movers and shakers um no. and the side quests that you do are very much like the they're not saga style they're very much like the mmo um go out and find this item and bring it back um, yeah they they utilize character um specific skills but that's about yeah. it really it feels a, a little it's a little undercooked for me in places as much as i do really yeah. like it no i agree with that i kind of love it adored it um but yeah there's definitely some things that need work on um. mm. so that's uh that's octopath traveler really popular game among our audience i thought it was super cool but unfortunately fell off it uh, does, do we have anything else from the list that we want to discuss next because it's i mean there's zero percent chance we finish it we polish all these off um, Am I the only person who's played Unavowed? I have no idea what that is. No, you possibly are. It's the Watcher Eye game, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. It's yeah. The latest, I mean, curious the about Watcher Eye. Yeah. These they did they did uh, Gemini Rue. They did 
uh, actually, I don't, I don't know if they did do Techno Babylon. I think they just published that, but they 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 publish and develop games. And Unavowed is the latest from them, which is um, it's this kind of like it, it's got like a little bit of a World of Darkness setting going on the um, the the tabletop campaign uh, where um, it th- when the game opens, you are uh, in the midst of being uh, exercised, uh, and a demon is leaving your body by um this uh lady who's a djinn and her partner who's this fire mage um and um apparently like you've spent the past six months just like running havoc all over new york city manipulating people and using these demonic powers but uh it wasn't your fault um and you get brought into uh this agency called the unavowed of these uh hidden uh hidden people with uh magical powers who keep uh keep chaos at bay and function as kind of like a supernatural uh detective agency um and each of the chapters is split into like a a different um a different supernatural incident and you select like which what members of the unavowed you want to take with you and that um determines how you solve puzzles Oh this, wow! This... this almost this sounds almost like the inverse of another game on this list that I'll talk about in a little bit. But th- 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 that that's a really crazy uh, way to implement sort of different puzzle solving techniques instead of having just a big bag of items that may or may not be used up once you, once you implement them. Yeah. So like the the gin may excel in. Um... Uh, situations that require strength um, while the like the fire mage can um, one of his abilities is that like he can read uh, any text that has been burned so if uh, somebody's trying to cover their tracks by like burning notes he can he can read them in this flame realm uh, or you can uh, bring along like a spirit medium who will uh, talk to the dead and uh, try and shed some more light on the situation Um, it's it's there's a lot of possibilities. There's a it's a giant script with many diverging paths and lots of voice acting. And um, while I'm only maybe halfway through it, I really really like what it's doing. And it really does feel like um, an adventure game setting of like a magical realism tabletop session. They're so good at that. They're so good at doing capturing that, but also mm. not making it too convoluted like some of LucasArts older games maybe. Yeah, it's it's super friendly, and I think it's more about getting you through the experience rather than, because um, like I I tried to play Day of the Tentacle recently with my partner, um, and uh, <laughs> that game has some. It is like if you did not have a hint book. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, if a you lot go of those puzzles just to... don't make sense. Yeah, if you go back and listen to us fumble our way for Grim Fandango, I think you may be... Yeah, yeah same issue same. there. Yeah, those podcast episodes from, I believe, uh, August of 2017. Um, but I, I think games like uh, like what Wajidai does, and maybe to a lesser degree, um, games like Broken Age, these are uh, developers that really love that era of adventure games, but in mm-hmm. recreating games like that are applying more modern design sensibilities and uh, and, yeah. and making them feel more accessible. And while, while they're not to, replicating, they're yeah, evolving. They, yeah, yeah, they're not replicating, they're evolving and they're and they want and they're trying to preserve the the strengths of those of that kind of game. Yeah, it's 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 frequently very funny too. I really like its sense of humor. Um like there's this one bit where um there's a um friendly poltergeist trying to um communicate with you to like get into this building and solve this mystery that's happened there so it's like writing on the window in con- condensation and it's like <laughs> it's just like writing out come on grab that brick break this window um and if if you the protagonist pick the brick up and try to hurl it you just like <laughs> you don't have that much upper arm strength so you just like limply <laughs> throw it and it just falls back down and then you just see like a giant omg written on the window <laughs> oh, I like that. It's really funny. But you have to switch. Um, you have to switch to the genie to throw the rock. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Oh. Yeah, it's a it's a really cute game. Um, we don't have a review up at the moment, but now, okay, that does sound cool. I am interested in it now. I might I might have to add that to my Steam wish list. We'll see. But mm-hmm. I'm going to switch to a different game that also has fire mages and character switching. 
Um, and it also doesn't have a review on the site because I've been taking my sweet time playing it. Uh, um, Shadows Awakening is a game made by a Slovenian developer that is a Ooh. an isometric RPG that's a little like Diablo or uh, Divinity Original Sin. Um, but it has the weird mechanic, instead of being exercised from a demon at the beginning, you are willingly... Uh, um, summoning a demon at the very beginning, <laughs> use use uh, a mysterious mage some, who's voiced by a uh, by an old Doctor Who actor, uh, uh, summons a demon, and this demon is called a devourer and has the power to devour the souls of fallen warriors, and by doing that, he will use those uh, the bodies of those warriors like puppets in the uh, in the mortal realm. And uh, so you'll control these characters just like they're RPG characters, but we'll, but you can switch between who the puppet is using the demon's power. So you you almost you uh, you recruit characters by devouring their souls and then equip them like loadouts and switch between them on the fly like you're playing Trine or something. I don't know. It's um and the and uh, it's the the story gets pretty cool. Like there's a it's a big world that they've created here. There's a conspiracy of mages that have summoned other devourer demons that you're and they've used the devourer demon powers to uh to like put um imposter royalty on the thrones of very of various uh of various nations. And you're you're trying to upend the conspiracy. It's it, it it's a cool it has a lot of cool RPG stuff going on, and the character switching it's pretty crazy. With you know situations like one character throws an oil grenade, other switch to the fire mage, they set everything ablaze with every all the enemies' uh, fire resistance reduced, and the diversity of characters gets crazy. There's a big zombie golem that you get early on. Uh, you choose between a barbarian, a, a rogue, a, a, an archer, and a fire mage at the very beginning. Um, there's a giant wasp that you can recruit when you uh, with a quest where there's a uh, oh there's boy. there's basically a tree that's consumed with the uh, that that has a hive of wasps that's threatening the tree's health and then you can sort of uh, choose to side with the wasps or side with the tree <laughs> and depending on who you side with you either get to you either kill like uh, a wasp warrior and get him as on your party or you destroy the tree and you get a, a like dryad spirit in your party. <laughs> It, it gets it gets pretty crazy, um, and I like a lot of what's going on with it. And there's uh, it, it gets weird because these the uh, people you recruit normally do not like having their souls manipulated by a devourer demon, so they'll argue with you and complain when you make them do things, and uh, and they'll even argue with each other since their souls are basically inhabiting the same body. And uh, it, some characters that knew each other in life do not appreciate being trapped in the same body in death. So it's it, it takes a very unusual tech with a lot of uh of rpg uh stuff and i'm liking it a lot but the problem is it's just this game just sort of lacks polish a little bit like it, it is definitely inspired by diablo and sacred and probably uh probably uh, uh shoot moba games that that have a large that have large casts of characters but um it's a little janky the, the textures aren't great it kind of looks like a game maybe from uh from several years ago even though you can get it on ps4 and it's uh, it's also so, so it's a Diablo esque action RPG. It's a Diablo esque a action <laughs> RPG with elements okay. of like you know, oh I don't know uh, like old Eternity engine ga action games. Interesting. That, there's Interesting. more there's more storytelling than in a Diablo game, uh -huh. and uh, and more world interaction. But it does not have the polish or the intense action of a Diablo game, and does not have the amazing script oh. of those like of like those old Bioware action games. But it's. It's super fun and does a couple unique things that I really, really like. So I hopefully will finish it soon. The problem is there's just too many games and not enough time. Mm. Mm -hmm. and it's called Shadows Awakening. But uh, what else do we want to have? Do we have on the list that we want to discuss? Uh, I can talk about a game that wasn't well reviewed for the site, but I quite liked, and that was uh, Atelier Lydia and Swell, the Alchemist of the Mysterious Paintings. Okay, quick question. Do you jump yeah. into paintings like Mario 64? You do, yes. That's exactly right. Okay, all right. Oh. The sequel to Portrait of Ruin that I never knew I always wanted. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I think was it Derek who reviewed it for the site? I don't think he was very keen on Derek it. Derek has probably reviewed 53 uh, Atelier games. Mm -hmm. over the and I think, I think that may be the problem as to why he didn't like it. Well, he made a super cut of um, some of the most egregious voice acting um, in this oh, yeah. title, which is um, kind of ear searing. Yeah, the, the two sisters had some very annoying <laughs> voice acting choices to make them sound in quotation marks. I'm doing ear quotation marks. Cute. 
uh, but it just turned out to be kind of annoying. But I always feel like Atelier game protagonists always are kind of annoying. <laughs> they're they're all very vapid. Uh, but I think when you just have to be in the right mood for an Atelier game. At least I do. And mm-hmm. I don't, maybe just Derek wasn't in the mood for the sort of uh, vapidness of the Atelier protagonists at that time. Well, they're always very cute and very pastel colored. And mm-hmm. um, and always have some uh, implementation of crafting or synthesis in the gameplay. But I've only played like one and a half Atelier games, and they which one? Uh, I played Atelier Iris Eternal Mana, and then okay. I, and the, then I started. The yeah, and then I yeah. started one of the uh, one of the PS3 ones, but didn't get very far. I was borrowing it from a friend. Okay, so see the the the, the PS2 games are so different from what the Atelier mm-hmm. games are right now. Yeah, they okay. Are. They're they're very more like I feel like the PS2 games are trying to bring more uh, traditional JRPG mechanics to Atelier, but yeah. since the PS3 onwards, it's gone kind of back to its roots as what uh, Atelier Violet and all that were in Marie, and it's, it kind of uh, feels like those PS2 games were like almost them testing the waters for a worldwide uh, push. Yeah, it was like yeah. to be more, more inclusive of like yeah, like everyone could find something like. And I really love the PS2 games. I think it probably yeah. is my favorite era of Atelier, and I wish they would do, they would kind of go back to that a little bit, at least just for like maybe one trilogy or and something. This, and, and this, yeah, this series, this series started out on the PS1, but the first one we got was uh, was Iris Eternal Mana, I think. That's was right. it the PS1? Yeah. I think the first like Atelier game I ever played was Annie, and I think I just picked that. So that's a DS game, and it's like, got a real soft spot for Annie. I like Annie a lot, that's and cool. it's, yeah, it's and it's oh, she's she's the best protagonist I think of <laughs> any of the Atelier games. I really like Annie, mm. uh, but uh, no, I, I like Lydia and Sewell as well. I think uh, the the whole concept of jumping into the paintings and it, it allows for more interesting set pieces. Uh, the, the you know in the previous games maybe just like you're just kind of going through another field another desert or something like this but like they can really let their imagination go wild when you're literally jumping into a painting and you're like it's a Halloween painting and there's little pumpkins flying around and that's cute and or you're going to like uh, a a ruined like uh, underwater sea temple which is also and there's little fish and swimming about and that's fun. So it really is more interesting to look at. And I and I really like what the Mysterious trilogy kind of done because it was like they were doing something different in each game. And I think Sophie was like the most traditional, but then Ferris was kind of like an open world Atelier. You just really just wandered through the world with no real goal and then eventually you'd hit an end. And a lot of people didn't like that, but I really liked it. And this one is all about uh, jumping into paintings and that's a lot of fun. Cool. Um, and again, admittedly, I uh, am not very aware of the development arc or the story arc of the Atelier mm-hmm. games, but I, I just, it's one of those things like, uh, I've probably t- said this before, but kind of like dot hack games in the 2000s, there seemed to be like a new one every three months, and I was just, oh, yeah. uh, and I was just overwhelmed, like, yeah. wait, 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 is this the same one that I saw here a few weeks ago? <laughs> they are. <laughs> They're the annual JRPG now. They've taken Tales over as the like annualized RPG series. Um, they've, been, they've been annualized for probably over a decade, unless unless I'm really overestimating it. Maybe five six years, I would say. But yeah, they've been there's been one every year at least for, since I've been here. <sighs> so, what else do we have on the list that we want to discuss? Uh, I kind of wanted to talk a little, just a real quick on uh, Darksiders 3, because I'm playing that for review as uh, of this yes. recording. Peter, you normally <laughs> have Fury, but this time you're m- controlling Fury. Yes, indeed. The The third horseman of the apocalypse is a lady named Fury, and she's awesome. She's legitimately one of the things about this game that I'm going to be, like, 100% positive on. She's great. Um... I'm a big fan of the Darksiders games. I really liked the, I love the first one and I really liked the second one. You have recorded three podcast episodes on them. <laughs> and uh, so when the THQ and Vigil games went under, it's like, well, it's sad to see, kind of wished what we would have gotten the third game. And then THQ Nordic picked up the rights and they made a new studio with a bunch of the old developers. And the result is. It's not terrible. It's just a weird step back for the series. And it's also really, really technically not 
optimized at all. THQ Nordic seemed to be doing this kind of um, uh, like Bloomhouse model or like kind of Furyu, where they're like they're they're bringing back um, uh, older franchises um, and like not like or maybe even be like. Yeah. Buying up, yeah, like buying up old IPs or even old developers and trying to see if they can um, recreate or, uh, or or finally release um, dead or dying projects. It because mm-hmm. from what you're saying, Peter, like, 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 of success. like like yeah. this game seemed to be hastily made. It really does because like there are good ideas in this game. So like the the first two Dark Siders games were um, Zelda clones. Like you explored an overworld. You solved puzzles with items you got. There were dungeons, bosses that relied on using the item you found in that dungeon. Um, and so the series has always kind of cribbed on other games. Um, Diablo, uh, Darksiders 2 added this like Diablo loot system that I thought was really engaging. And Darksiders 3 goes for a bit more of a Dark Souls approach. And I know that's kind of a hackneyed comparison to make in the year of our Lord 2018. But it's it's a third-person action-adventure game where you fight enemies... Um, get souls for killing them. And when you die, you leave your items behind and then you go back to a checkpoint that is also your level up screen and, uh, and have to f- backtrack to get back to where you died and retrieve your items. Um, that doesn't one, one, sound like what people want from dark siders. No, it's, it's not. And, and, and it's, and honestly, and this is one of the things I'm going to be talking about more when I, um, when I finish it and review it, um, the, uh, the car combat feels good in Darksiders three, like fury fights with a whip and the, it feels very satisfying. Uh, your moves have a lot of weight and impact and you can do the, like the scorpion and get over here thing, which is awesome. Uh, and, and the encounter, but the encounter design is like the old Darksiders games where they tend to put you in a room with tons of enemies, but it's now a souls born clone so these enemies do a crap ton of damage and you're surrounded on all sides. You have a dodge that uh, gives you, if you dodge at the last second, it gives you like the Bayonetta or near Automata slow down counterattack thing, which is like the key of the combat system. But said dodge also has no iframes and you can't break from the attack animation. And, oh. and you're fighting six enemies and it's Dark Souls. So they're going to take a third of your health with every hit. And they can interrupt your combo and you die a lot because it, and it's for reasons that are not your fault. Like this is honestly one of the few games where I would straight up say, if you're a Darksiders fan and you must play this, I understand. I'm glad to see this IP back in some form, but play the, the, the lowest difficulty, the st- story difficulty is about on par with Darksiders 2's normal difficulty. And it's a way wow. better experience. Jeez. And then you still have to contend with the fact that I've had, there is tons of slowdown. Like anytime there are multiple enemies on screen, the game just starts to chug. Uh, yeah. Last night I had the uh, skybox vanish on me and then items started flickering. <laughs> oh, literally, boy. literally the skybox literally disappeared. The whole game went like, like the lighting went off. So every texture was like super bland and items started flickering in and out of existence oh, for like a, a solid, a solid like 10, 15 seconds. Um, there's a bot. There's a boss fight against Lust, um, where the uh, the you're fighting the seven deadly sins in this game. Ah, so this is Persona Five and Dark Souls. Indeed, and Full Metal Alchemist too. Oh my! Um, I was thinking that. <laughs> but um, and and during the cutscene, every time the camera pans back to Lust, um, it takes another half second for. Her. <laughs> uh. It takes. It takes another half second for her uh, textures to load in, so you can see like the rest of her I can model. See it all. It is so <laughs> bad. It's it, it just it, it's 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 a bummer, and and there's I guess there's good stuff to be had in here, but uh, like it's not the first example of IPs being brought back this year and being technical, like having technical difficulties. Like to segue very slightly into the Secret of Mana remake. Um, <laughs> Like, oh, that game crashed on me 25 times in 25 hours. Wow. So, oh, goody. Uh, yeah, so it's not, like, the only example. And it's really sad because it's just, like, they want they want, they want, want to give something to you, which is great. Like, Darksiders sounds... Some of the cool bits sound really cool. Like, I love the Metroid-style stuff. Dark Souls mechanics will work if they work. But when you're doing it in the wrong frame and not giving it the love and attention it deserves, then... 
you know, for sure you're going to annoy some people and definitely not get what you want out of it. And it sounds like that's exactly what's happened here, really. Mm. Yeah. That's probably um, enough about Darksiders 3. Uh, what else do we have on this list? Because because uh, we're starting to run out of time here. Uh, I'll go with the one I want to discuss first, because we've already had a Metroid, so I'll have a segue. Uh, time Spinner. Um... Oh, yeah. That's... <laughs> That game might be at the top of my list of 2018 games I wish I had played, because everything about this seems just so dope. Yeah, it's delightful. Um, picked it up after Derek's glowing review, and I think, Fenner, you were playing it as well, and I just couldn't really resist oh, it yeah. anymore. Um, uh, yeah, it is wonderful. Um, so it is through and through Metroidvania. It is very much castlevania Symphony of the Night slash Order of Ecclesia. Uh, I have no problems with it oh. at all because if you do Metroidvania right, then you do it right. And it's not, it's really easy to get wrong, but it's also, if once you get it right, it's like a real sweet spot. And Time Spinner really has that. Um, so, story wise, you are Lunias, who is the oh, timekeeper, I think they call them. She has the power to control the Time Spinner, and some empire comes along, destroys it, and kills her mother um, while she's using it. And so her mother sends her back. Well, she thinks she sends her back into time, um, but she ends up on another planet where the Empire is from, and you have the ability to swap between two time periods, which is the Empire in the present day and the Empire in the past. Uh, they have two separate maps. They're fairly similar, but there are some differences, visual and uh, structural. Um, but the main draw of Time Spinner is its orb system. So rather than having weapons, Linnaeus can equip two elemental orbs. They can be two of the same element, or they can be two one different ones so you can have like a fire one and a sword one on or you can have an axe one and a sword one or you can have two swords on is, is uh, there is there a benefit to two of the same because like if they're if they're on say square and circle uh like what's the difference between having two swords or just one sword and mashing square uh no difference really uh so you only need to press the same button i think it's a circle button twice so whatever yeah. orb is in front of you is the first one after Okay. Yeah, so it depends on how you like your hitboxes and how you like timing. I tended to stick to the two of the same because, I don't know, like, I like nice. the consistency. <laughs> it looks nice, yeah. Oh, the consistency of, like, the hitbox and the timing of the attacks. I could predict when they were going to hit and things like that. Okay. Uh, you also have three different sets, so you can swap between three different builds because you also have three... You have two things you can equip. So you have, I think, one's a ring, which gives you a passive ability. Um, so something like a shield or constant healing or quicker regen of magic and then you have a necklace which allows you to use special attacks so i guess like portrait of ruins kind of dual attacks and things like that um but hmm. yeah it's just really smooth and sweet and uh yeah um but the other things i really liked about time spinner um uh, the maps are pretty good. Um, they're not incredible. I think if I was going to do one thing, I would maybe have two slightly bigger, maybe different area maps because they do match up quite a bit. Um, the underground sections in particular tend to match up almost identically, but there are some different things there. There's different enemies. Um, most of the story as well as told through collectibles. So you have journal entries to pick up, which are written by your mother you have um, historical documents to pick up in the library to find out about the world. And then you have war notes about the war in the past. So there's different ways you can find out. And you piece things together. Um, it can be a bit jarring sometimes because in the very few story cutscenes, one character can say something and Lunias will already know the answer. But other times you'll, you'll, you'll pick most things up. Everything's pretty easy and accessible to pick up. But... It just kind of nailed it for me. Like, I don't really know. I, I love Metroidvania. Symphony of the Night is one of my all-time favorite games. And this mm, just kind of nailed too. it for me. And, and I think that um, the indie game space also has many uh, Symphony of the Night fans. With it because, <laughs> yeah. because there's a surprisingly num number, uh, excuse me, surprisingly high number of pretty good Metroidvania indie games um, yeah, and, and this this might be just one of the best ones though, because like I, when I, everything I read about that that everything I read about this game was that mechanically it was super good. It was it felt very similar to Symphony of the Night, but in a way that was homage and not mimicry. And yeah. uh, and and also they were praising the um the uh, the, the different sort of character types and even uh, uh character sexualities in the game. Pretty gay Metroidvania, and I'm, I've got time for that. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Sure. Exactly. It does it really well as well. Like, it's all side content, and it's just so... It's just part of them. Like, 
Yeah, it, it, it's it, 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 it's not a game about uh, sexuality. It's a game that normalizes sexuality, exactly. and it, yeah. in a way, in a way that is, uh, it, it isn't obtrusive. It's like the first game I think I've played for years that's had really good representation. Representation matters because when people that aren't used to representation see that representation, they it, they, they celebrate it. There's a thousand examples of it, and it, and it, it you know it. It warms the cockles of my shriveled up Grinch heart every time. <laughs> uh, so, all right, Time Spinner. Again, a game that sounds super dope that I really want to get to eventually, but sadly couldn't in 2018. What else do we have to cross off still? I think the only other really important one that we should talk about is Nino Kuni 2. Um, I, have, I, I have one more beyond that. But mm -hmm. we, we can do can, Nino Kuni 2 right now. Uh, Peter, I know you played that, but uh, you, you didn't like it as much as the I, consensus, I right? Did not, I did not like it, no. Um, which is a shame, because I wanted to. It's... Did you like the first game? No. No, I did not. I was also really disappointed by the first game. I feel like Nino Kuni 2 is an overcorrection. Um it is by now, far. It is. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Yeah. Now, please correct me if I'm wrong. The part of the plot of Nino Kuni 2 is that the president of a nation gets transported to a fantasy world and fights in a in a suit and tie with a gun in this fantasy world. Pretty yeah, much. So, but you also, okay, so, how is that not, not awesome? How is not the game of the decade? So this is this is how so this is how Nino Kuni 2. Yeah, sorry, Alan. No, you're going to do exactly what I'm going to do, so go ahead. So, <laughs> Nino Kuni 2 opens with um, pr the president The president of, of fake America is driving around, mm -hmm. and, a nuke, and a nuke gets dropped on his city in the first minute. This happens. Excellent. He, yeah. as, he is engulfed by the, as he is engulfed by the ensuing shockwave, he is transported to... Nino Kuni to the this world. This is already the greatest um, isekai story of all time, but please continue. And, and he, is, he is transported to this other world, and he is de-aged to the point that he is now a pretty anime boy. And he <laughs> I'll allow it. And he just so happens to appear in the bedchamber of Evan Pettywhisker Tildrum, real name, OC, do not steal. Um, <laughs> who, uh, I remember that. Who is, in the, who is in the process of um, he's his he's getting overthrown. He's a cat boy, and there is a. This game is already a nine of, out of ten. It's trending <laughs> upward. So the rats, the, the mice are the mice are rising up against the the mice are rising up against the cats. And at one point, in order to save Evan from an attacking mouse soldier, Roland pulls out a real ass Glock and shoots it in the face. <laughs> so this, how is, is any of this so disappointing? Confused. Because okay. <laughs> It is it's so much better on paper. It is a <laughs> lot. Okay, yeah, yeah. I love it. Um, no, I just Nino Kuni One's problem was that the combat mechanics were bad and it wasn't fun and it was also stupid hard for no reason. Yeah, it was, a, it was Kuni, a very it was a very beautiful game that could that its mechanics oh, were yeah. so inscrutable to me. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I I I dropped that thing after five or six hours just because just because combat was a chore, even though. And, even though Drippy and, and a lot of the setting were, was delightful. But anyway, we're, we're talking about the second one. And, and Nino, Nino Kuni 2's combat is better, and it, like objectively better. It's 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 more real-time and tails -y where like you have like, act, act, you like swing your weapon in real time. You can switch between weapons on the fly, um, stuff like that. But it's also, it's easier, possibly even too easy, because on the, on the normal difficulty setting, after a couple battles, you're going to be breezing through these encounters before the enemy has a chance to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and it, Which is a shame, because the combat system feels better to control, but you basically have to jack the difficulty up in order for it to... in order to get any use out of it, which... Yeah. I, and that was the problem. And like I said, I didn't think Nino Kuni 2 was bad. I just fell off it. Like, I was like, after five hours, I was like, yeah, that's, uh, that's about it for me. It's weird, isn't it? Because I yeah. also played it. I beat it, and I actually platinumed it. Although, oh, to nice. give credit, I played it with my Alana, mom. the Platinum she... Princess. Like the, yeah, the year of Platinum for Alana. I've had six. I don't know how I've done it. Um, Holy crap. Whoa. I, I think I have <laughs> like maybe one eight. Ever. I, think I have like seven or eight ever. <laughs> Before this year, I had two. I now have six. So Or seven or eight on total. Um, three of them were Spyro games, though. So sh um, but, uh, uh, no shame. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, I played it with my mom. She played most of it, and I just kind of did all the city building and 
the Mama Hague's the secret power behind Alana's throne. I know, right? <laughs> exactly. I wish not. <laughs> not though. Um, but like, I liked parts of it. I love the city building mechanic. So it's kind of for people who haven't played it. Um, did you get this far, Peter? I'm assuming not, because it's quite I, maybe. I, I I think I got to the point where you could start doing it, and that's yeah. about when other games came out. I think this. I think this is where it really excels. I really, it's a kind of a bit like Dark Cloud 2, although you don't really have choice in where you can put buildings and things like that. So you can build your own kingdom and yeah. you can level up. Like a game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it reminds me of like the city building in uh, in Bravely Default or a, or an idle game mm. where you have to like uh -huh. wait 30 minutes before you, you can you can finish building the blacksmith or something. And or yeah. maybe even a little bit like a Suikoden game where you sort of build the build your main town as the game continues. But uh, yeah. uh, I thought this game had a pretty positive overall reception. Caitlin gave it a 90 in her review and loved the city building parts of it. I loved it. It's probably one. It's probably my favorite part of the game. Um, I really enjoyed it because you recruit a hundred people to work in your kingdom. Some awesome. of them like enhance your like what weapons you can craft. Other ones enhance what items you can buy. Other ones pick up like gather items that you can trade for other things. And then do, other do people the, like do, do the. 100 each have a star assigned to them and appear on a stele in the middle of your castle? I wish. <laughs> I'm afraid they don't. Wrong oh, podcast rats. episode. Um, but, yeah, I really love that aspect of it. Um, I like the combat. I had problems with the camera. Like, the camera felt really janky to me. But I do really like how much more fluid and faster it is. Um, uh, what I struggled with was the like entire twenty hour section in the middle. Like there doesn't seem to be anything that happens between the point where you get your own kingdom and then the point where you get back your home. Uh, spoilers. <laughs> um, but like, mm, it's sure. it's just like I don't know. Like you could basically the aim is is that you go around and get all of these other kings to sign a treaty so you can rejoin together and get back your own kingdom and defeat big bad evil and whatever. But like it's just like chasing nothing most of the time you're just like i'm gonna chase a lead oh let's go this way and things like that so um, it, I, so it feels a little sort of empty in the middle going from plot point to plot point and you, you think the yeah. game could have been a bit shorter is i don't need to put words in your mouth no no you're right um uh but yeah i just i struggled with the middle section a lot um but like the city building was fun there's side quests along the way as well um also like the character variation i mean there is a really cool mechanic lady with pink hair who i dig to hell oh my god awesome. <laughs> um like the characters that you get they all share weapons so not all the same like there's pairing so that every character has a primary weapon and a sub weapon um most character like, most people share one sub weapon and one primary weapon so evan and roland both use a sword as their primary weapon they have different sub weapons in that roland has a gun and evan has a wand but um bracken who is the mechanic girl has a gun as her sub weapon and then has a hammer as her primary weapon but another character has a hammer so there's like not really any unique gameplay going on okay. uh, between many of the characters and also the first three characters you get are probably the best characters and the only characters you really need to use i found i didn't changed my party up at all um so there wasn't really a lot going there but i mean it's a good game like it's definitely better than the first game but i think um yeah i i didn't really agree with all of the praise and felt that like i think yeah i could have done with it a different time maybe i think it's come out in the wrong year i think maybe two years ago i would have loved it more but i think now i'm a bit swamped and there was other things that i enjoyed a hell of a lot more mm. right so Nino Kuni 2, um, very good. We, it was it was well reviewed, well reviewed on our site, but maybe just a little bit lost in the shuffle of 2018, which ended up being a very dense year. Uh, we, there's a lot of games we didn't talk about. I'm looking at our big list: Assassin's Creed Odyssey, uh, okay. shoot, Detective Pikachu, God of That's War, it. Jimmy Assassin's and the Pulsating Mass, which got a really high review recently on our site. Assa uh, Assassin's Creed, another one. Fallout, yeah. another another one. <laughs> and there's also uh, let's see, multiple Yakuza games. Valkyria Chronicles 4, uh, oh shoot, um, Xenoblade Fist Chronicles, the big, big DLC. Oh yeah, Fist of the North Star. I, Fist of the North, I sort of um, wedge Fist, Fist of the North Star in with the other Yakuza team yeah. stuff. There's many games on this list that we didn't talk about, and that's uh, that just goes to show how strong 2018 was. There was... Uh, if, I, I thought 2017 was too many games, and 2018 might be more too many games. <laughs> 
Yeah. Only people who work at game sites say stuff like that. Oh, that's fair. Yeah. Game. <laughs> <laughs> Too much well, to do. <laughs> I mean, we work at game site at a game site, yeah. but we're all, we're all volunteers. So there, there's too many games that we spend time covering and not just playing. It, yeah. it would be easier to be a, a an RPG fan, as it were, if I didn't have to work at RPG fan. But I <laughs> but I but I love podcasting and I love the work that we all do and um. And I include the four of you with it as well. Like I, I think we're we did a great job in 2018, and we should be proud of all mm. the work we did. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it, it makes video games feel exhausting, and 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 uh, we we still love video games and RPGs in particular. But whew, sometimes it feels like there's too many games. But um, before we get into closing arguments, I, I'm going to extend this podcast by another 15 minutes because I'm a monster. Um, I have two questions I want to ask each of you, and I'll give my answers first to give you guys time to think, okay? The first question is, um, tell me one game that you're looking forward to in 2019. Uh, and, and even if it's not confirmed announced worldwide, if you reasonably can, if you're reasonably sure it's going to come out in 2019, you can use that. And second, uh, if you have one, please tell me your uh, favorite episode of Retro Encounter that you recorded in 2018. So I'll, I'll give you guys some time. I, I sprung these on you as a surprise, so I'm not playing fair here. But uh, for me, um, the game I'm looking forward to the most this year is. This is going to sound strange. It. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it might be Persona Q2. Uh, okay. uh, it, it just came out in Japan in November, and I had a basically Persona Free 2018 because I, I binged hard on Persona 5, but I got the I played through it twice and got the platinum trophy in 2017. But it's been long enough that I think I want to hang out with the uh, Phantom Thieves and the and the Execution Squad and the uh, Investigation Team again. And um, Persona Q. I liked the first Persona Q a lot, and Q2 mm. doesn't seem to have as good a, a soundtrack as the first one, which I thought was a great strength of Persona Q1. But I'm really excited for Persona Q2. I hope it comes out in 2019. It's not confirmed for a worldwide release yet, but I really want it to. And, oh, uh, it will. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, <laughs> and the, the plot setup here is uh, you go into a, 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 like, a magical movie theater and get trapped in movie worlds. And I think the first two are a superhero movie world and a dinosaur attack movie world. And uh, <laughs> those, are, those are some Persona sages I would, I would love to draw maps in. So it sounds great to me. Um, and second, uh, the uh, Retro Encounter episodes I had the most fun recording. This probably isn't a surprise. I had so much fun playing Suikoden 2 in September. <laughs> yes, that was yeah, probably I, my favorite as well. Yeah, they, uh, I, I had never, I had tried Suikoden 1 and 3 before and never got uh, very far, but this one I sort of, I forced my way to get through a slowish beginning, and then once you get into the into the real core of Suikoden 2. It's it's excellent, and I uh, I'm really happy I finally got to play that, and it was really fun to discuss on the uh, on the podcast with uh, uh with you with both of you, Liana uh, Leona and Alana. I accidentally combined your names for a second there. Liana, that's cool. <laughs> Liana, what's too powerful for this world? Oh no, yeah, we're a fusion dance, huh? <laughs> 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 So, uh, does anyone else want to talk about a 2019 game they're looking forward to and maybe a favorite episode of Retro from 2018? Yes. I can, I'm looking forward to uh, Fire Emblem Three Houses. Oh, right! Oh, yeah. Damn. I'm I am pretty hyped about that. I'm super interested to see if they're, what they're going to change up, if they're going to change up things from the, the 3DS games. I hope so, because I wasn't a biggest fan of Fates, but... As well as the Switch just being a great console, I'm super excited about to see what I mean, they're going to do. A, a full 25% of our Fire Emblem episode a couple months ago was just ragging uh -huh. on the fates. <laughs> what it really was. It was great fun, though. I love that. It was actually, <laughs> which leads me into what my favorite podcast, if it wasn't Sweeted into, hey it probably would have been the one we did on Fire Emblem and we just roasted fates for a good half hour. <laughs> Awesome. Anyone else have a have want to come to the blackboard and try to solve the equation? Yeah, um, I've come around on Sekiro: Shadows Die Twice. I want to see what that is going to be. Mm, um, that, is that the is that the From Software one? That is. That's the From right. Software Samurai that, Combat. I, I don't know how it happened, but we're getting like four Samurai Combat games in 2019. Somehow <laughs> right. we are. Uh, but in my heart of hearts, what I really uh, can't wait to come out is Ooblets. Oh, yeah. That looks so cute. Ooblets I've, I've is seen, so cool. Hasn't that been at demos for like two years? 
Um, maybe like one year. Okay. I saw it at um, I saw it at EGX uh, at the beginning of this year, and it is a um, it's a Pokemon style game where like you're the new kid in town and you inherit a farm and you plant seeds and they grow into these little creatures called ooblets. And um, the build I played, it had like these sort of um, it had like Pokemon battles where like with like cute little moves like Snoot Boop um, and you're like poking <laughs> each other on the nose. And um, over the course of the year, they've determined that like it's not really fitting with like the mood that they're trying to uh, cultivate with this game. So they've changed it to dance battles. No. Oh. Snoot Boop or whatever it was. Snoot, Snoot Boop is pretty good, but like I would play a Pokemon. A little mushroom I... man and a bear in a pair of jeans, like break dancing at each other. I'm all here for that. I'm here for that as well. Plus, just as good. That yeah. sounds great. And now I'm thinking of like Pokemon Street with dance battles. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm down. Um, but uh, the the build I played um, as early as it was, it was incredibly satisfying and just joyous to have a little run around in. So like if you want like a an, an earnest but kind of like Twitter humor take on Pokemon, um, Ooblets is is going to deliver, I do believe. Uh, and in terms of uh, favorites that I've been on this year, I haven't been on a whole bunch of episodes this year. Um, I've been trying to catch my breath with everything else I've been doing. However, um, I did uh, have the uh, honor of uh, hosting the the Mega Man Legends duology um, in September, which was a really nice excuse to um, to to replay. Well, I say replay. I mean, play those games in English for the first time and um, experience them. And um, that was um, that was a real joy. Cool. So Alana or Peter, do you have a fa uh, an interested upcoming game from 2019 or a favorite episode of Retro from 2018? Uh, Kingdom Hearts 3, January. <laughs> okay, I'm, sure. I'm down. I'm excited. It looks great. Apparently copies are in the wild already, so I got to keep my ears shut for spoilers. Uh, yeah, I saw oh, that. Geez. But um, yeah, I'm it's I'm really looking forward to playing that. Everything we've seen of three so far looks amazing, and I'm really excited to see how this all this whole thing wraps up. And then uh, for favorite retro episodes, uh, I really love doing Shadow Hearts. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. So jealous! I love that game. They yeah, were they so were good. they were fantastic. I should probably go back and play that thing because it's not very long, and I really liked Shadow Hearts too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's well worth it. I agree. Cool. So, Alana, your turn. One upcoming game you're interested in and one retro episode that you enjoyed. Oh, I don't have one. Um, I'll use the same one I used last year, although, again, I don't think it's going to come out in 2019, even though it's been delayed again. Um, Indivisible is just going into oh. alpha. Um, oh. I, I really, really want it, but I think if it's going into alpha now, I think it's probably early 2020 more than anything. Hmm. Um, I'm going to cheat and say a non-RPG and say Devil May Cry 5 then. <laughs> awesome. Nice. Um, I'll allow it. I, I almost, I almost said that instead of Persona Q2. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if we're going to go RPG, then uh, in uh, blah, 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 I don't know how many days, 13, 14 days from this episode, uh, Tales of Vesperia, it will be out That's again. That's right, yeah. And I'm in there. I'm there every day. Um, but uh, I also haven't been on much retro this year, which sucks because I promised to be on more. Um, but other than Suikoden 1 and 2, which I loved, um, I'm going to say the RPG World Tour episode, which was a delight. Uh, yeah, that um, that yeah, episode was a lot um, of fun to record, yeah. Yeah, it was a blast to learn about different worlds and talk about my favorite yeah. worlds because, you know, I've got to get those Skies of Arcadia props in every episode I'm in, and I did it. <laughs> I feel like an idiot because I like when I listed my like, a favorite podcast i never mentioned the one that i actually hosted and organized which was golden sun and i feel like I should probably mm. mention that, I did that and i really enjoyed that and keegan and tress were great friends and supported me throughout that and i'm so appreciative for them being so good on that podcast with me and uh, i almost maybe my i don't know if it was my second favorite of the year but uh leona you and i on the 999 podcast just 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 there, w yeah. just listening to hillary and uh trent react to the to, to the nonsense in that game was it like dank and romper all over again yes yes yeah. very cool. very similar I, mm. I can't listen to those episodes though no, nah, you, you, you gotta you gotta play through the game first, um, and the way to play through nine 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 is to play through it once cold, and then check a guide to get the two story important endings. 
uh, cool. to, to, to finish it. And but even like even playing it that way, that game is an experience. Oh boy, it was a lot of fun to yeah. play. And I um I'm I, I'm this close to just starting up Virtue's Last Reward and making us podcast about that. <laughs> so the, making us, we're like begging on the podcast. So like, can we <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it will happen. I don't know. I don't know it's exactly. The best one. I don't know if, exactly yes. when, but I, I think we, there will be a Virtue's Last Reward episode in 2019. But I'm not prepared to say exactly when. Um, no. But anyway, it's a. Uh, it is time to look ahead uh, in the podcast. Um, next week we are going to have a Dragon Quest XI episode. We hinted at it earlier in this episode. <laughs> We're um, just bringing back, bringing a bunch of Dragon Quest fans together to talk spoilers about that game, and it's very selfish of me because I've been wanting to talk about that game on a podcast <gasps> basically since the moment I finished it in early October. I'm pretty sure I've had one DM a week saying, "You want to do one?" I'm like, "I haven't finished it yet." Like... <laughs> I've been, I, you're not the only person I've solicited that. <laughs> I was that, that say. Form. Yeah. Um, but so there is going to be a, a Dragon Quest 11 episode next week, um, and following that, we are having uh, two episodes on Kingdom Hearts One, which is uh, a, ga- a game that Peter, I think you're going to be very excited to talk about, and I'll, I'll be perhaps slightly less excited to talk about. Uh, it'll, it'll be the emotional roller coaster. <laughs> it'll be fun. It'll be fun. I'm excited. <laughs> so yeah, um, two episodes on Kingdom Hearts one in January, and also in January. Um, let's see. Uh, I think we're gonna do an episode that's not about RPGs at all. Oh, uh, we're, we're still that, that's still in the planning stage, but I'm I'm pretty sure we're just gonna have an episode that's about everything besides RPGs. So look, please look forward to that. Um. And also, uh, listeners, if you want to contact us, the best way to do so is via email. Email retro at rpgfan.com. The rpgfan.com also has message boards, a Facebook page, uh, di- uh, a Discord server of which Leona is one of the moderators. Um, yeah. something, st- something streaming on Twitch daily. Uh, two other podcasts, Random Encounter about current events and Rhythm Encounter about RPG fan music. And also a new Instagram page and a Twitter page. All of those things can be linked from the front page of rpgfan.com. Uh, and listeners, please review us on iTunes or Google Play or where, however you're finding us. We love feedback, and we read everything that is directed to us. But um, before we talk about our social media, I want to—I just want to thank everyone for uh, listening to 53 full episodes of Retro Encounter over 2018. Whether you listen to just a handful of them, or all of them, or none of them, and, are, and this is your first Retro Encounter episode ever, somehow. Uh, I, I, I really, I, I, my favorite thing in the world is to talk about shared experiences and, um, video games are my favorite hobby. So naturally I love talking to, about video games to, um, to, to people that share that enthusiasm. And I love the opportunity that RPG fan affords me to host a podcast about, about them. And I am grateful to every listener, every other panelist, uh, Brian, who edits half of the episodes, and everyone an RPG fan that lets Retro Encounter be a thing. And I'm, uh, I'm, I, like, I won't say all of the episodes are perfect, but I, I'm, I'm proud of the work that I do, and I'm very grateful to all four of you, Robert, Leona, Alana, Peter, for joining me on many episodes this year, and hopefully, <laughs> and hopefully appear on many episodes in 2019 as well. Definitely. Yeah, we'll be there. You can't get rid of me now. You you've got me hooked. Yeah, I, I Leona, <laughs> I bugged you about appearing on a podcast for several months before you relented to appear on those lunar episodes, and now I can't keep you off podcasts. Yeah, practically. yeah. I wasn't I wasn't sure it was for me, but then it, it turned out it was. <laughs> yeah, it turns out it turns out it turns out podcasting is just fun, and it's why I and it's why I've recorded so many. <laughs> okay, I, th- I think those lunar episodes were my favorite of the year. Oh, it, it was really great. Good. So, uh, yeah, thank you, listeners. Thank you, guests. Thanks, everyone. Uh, but wh- how can listeners find my guests? Um, g- please share your contact information that you're comfortable sharing, starting with you, Peter. Um, if you're looking, for, looking to reach me, you can hit me up uh, at I Have Fury on Twitter or email me, PeterT at RPGFan.com. And Alana. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Alana Hags, or you can find me on Discord at Diving Falcons. Leona, your turn. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Starmongoose, and you can also join our Discord server where I moderate and I'm also Starmongoose on there. And my phone number is zero seven. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're in the same country as me. I will shower you with lots of affection. Oh, well, I'll give you my phone number later. <laughs> Fine. I'm, I'm representing the soulless suburbs of the 703, as it were, right now. 
<laughs> so, uh, Rob, um, w- uh, what's your uh, <clears throat> social media presence like? You can find me on Twitter at MisanthraBob, where I am uh, currently expressing my um, abject horror at the idea of Hideo Kojima and Kanye West meeting. Oh, oh God! I, I was I did not appreciate Kanye West's return to Twitter a few days ago. That was that was that was not great. Yeah, yeah who does? I appreciate a number of his albums, but not a, not any of his social media presence. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Rob, you also have two fine podcasts that you host that I enjoy oh, very gosh. much whenever they release. Oh, come on, you know, you know, I like I like supporting my friends' works. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I was hosting a queer games podcast for the bulk of this year called Misspent Youth. Uh, it's currently on hiatus. We'll probably reconvene sometime next year. Uh, but my uh, main podcast, Misanthroplay, that I host with Alva Chua, is uh, coming back uh, this. Uh, this winter season, we've just had an episode on. We've had a game music episode go up, and we've got had an episode on on Red Dead Two go up, and we're going to record our end of the year soon. So check us out on Twitter at Misanthroplay. Now, really, the red. I mean, that episode did have some Red Dead Two stuff in it, but really, it was about Mega Man X, or that's my memory of the. Of yes, it was episode. just about Mega Man X, really. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> excellent, Ma- with an up, excellent with an excellent with an Maverick Hunter. X. He's a cowboy. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and okay so um, I guess that about does it um, my, my name is Mike Solosi you can find me on Twitter at the Real Monsoon. most of the time at Evoker for Dogs other times I am Monsoon on RPG Fans forums and Monsoon Mike on the RPG Fan Discord uh, this has been Retro Encounter in 2018 thank you, good night and good luck <laughs>